Hello everyone. Welcome to the lecture 9 for the course Bioinformatics for Schoolers. As you have learned in your previous lectures that the information from a DNA gets transcribed into an RNA which is further translated to form a protein. In this lecture, we will be learning about the concepts of secondary and tertiary structures of a protein and its functions. As you all know, proteins play an important role in our day-to-day -day life. From moving a muscle to digesting the food that we eat, proteins play critical roles in functioning of the human body. Have you ever wondered how does the oxygen that we breathe reaches the rest of our body? Several proteins function at the cellular level to carry out these life supporting processes. So let's begin with understanding what are proteins. Proteins are essential biomolecules that play countless roles. Some transport nutrients throughout our body, some help us fight against diseases, and many help us in maintaining strength and balance. Despite this wide range of functions, all of the proteins are composed of same building blocks known as amino acids. So what are amino acids? Amino acids are a group of organic compounds that share a common basic structure where a central carbon is attached to an amino group, a carboxylic acid group, a hydrogen atom and a variable side chain. Now, depending upon the variable side chain, there are 20 different types of amino acids which have different properties. Some are positively charged, some are negatively charged, some are hydrophobic in nature, while others are hydrophilic. So now you might be wondering that how does these amino acids form a protein structure? It is interesting to note that these amino acids arrange and connect with each other such that they form four protein structural organizations, namely primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure. Now let's learn about each of them in detail. The primary structure of a protein is a linear sequence of amino acids. Now, how are two amino acids connected? The two amino acids are connected via a covalent linkage known as peptide bond. The carboxyl group of one amino acid interacts with the amino group of another to form a peptide bond. In this process, a water molecule is released. And this linked series of carbon, nitrogen and oxygen make up the protein backbone where the two ends of the chains are referred to as the N-terminus and the C-terminus. This primary structure further folds into the secondary structure. But before understanding this, it is important to know that how do amino acids move around the peptide bond? This movement can be understood by understanding the movement of phi and psi angles. As you can see here, the phi angle is between, is around the nitrogen and the carbon alpha bond, while the psi angle is around the bond between carbon alpha and the carbon of the next amino acid. These angles are also known as dihedral angles and can rotate from minus 180 degree to plus 180 degree. So this movement allows the pro primary structure of protein to fold into a secondary structure, which is further stabilized by hydrogen bonds between the atoms of the peptide backbone. Based on different hydrogen bonding network, the primary sequence of a protein can either fold into an alpha helix or can fold into a beta sheet. An alpha helix takes up a spiral shape which is stabilized by the hydrogen bonds between every first and the fourth amino acid, while a beta sheet is stabilized by the hydrogen bonds formed between two or more adjacent strands. These strands can either fold into a parallel orientation or an anti-parallel orientation. And since now we have learned that the movement of phi and psi angles is important for protein folding, let us understand how does this movement help in forming correct secondary structures. Dr. G. N. Ramachandran utilized the information of the phi and the psi angles to create a Ramachandran plot, which is like a map to show the regions with stable secondary structure meaning it helps us to identify the regions where the fold is in allowed or the disallowed region. For example, the upper left region here is the allowed region for the correct beta sheet. The lower region here is the region for correct fold of alpha helix, while the white region here corresponds to the atoms in the disallowed or unfavorable regions. 
So now we know that the protein chain is allowed to move so that it can adopt different forms. However, to fold into a tertiary structure, the linear chain of amino acids also follows a specific path where the unfolded protein with a high energy folds into its most stable form by reaching the lowest energy. What does this lowest energy zone mean? It means that the protein has now taken up a native fold and this stable native fold of a protein is known as a tertiary structure. So tertiary structure of a protein is a three-dimensional shape which is stabilized by various interactions such as the hydrogen bonds, salt bridges, hydrophobic interactions, disulfide bonds, etc. It is interesting to note that the protein function depends on its tertiary shape or structure. This function is often performed by domains. Now, what is a domain? A domain is the basic structural unit of a protein that can fold into stable shape and function independently and can perform its function independently. Depending upon the size of the protein, it can have one or multiple domains. Now you might be wondering if the tertiary structure of the protein is its functional form, what are quaternary structures and why are they required? Many proteins require association with other protein subunits to perform their activity. This arrangement here is known as quaternary structure. Here, each of the subunits are linked with non-covalent interactions and they have their independent primary, secondary and tertiary folds. For example, the hemoglobin protein in our blood cell require the association between four protein subunits, namely two alpha subunits and two beta subunits, which helps them to bind efficiently to the oxygen molecule and deliver it to the various parts of the body. So to summarize, we have learned how amino acids fold together to form a protein structure. Now one can ask, how, does this, how do this protein structure help in its function? The mode of protein function is directly related with the shape and structure of a protein. A protein can either have a shape which can fit a small molecule or can have a binding site which fits another protein. Following these binding modes, protein performs diverse functions which can be understood with respect to the protein structure. One such example to understand this structure-function relationship of a protein is the digestive enzyme known as chymotrypsin. This is a digestive enzyme and the function of this enzyme is to cut other proteins. It is interesting to note that the production site of this enzyme is in pancreas while the site of action is in large intestine. So one may ask that why does it not leave the proteins in the pancreas? This is because for chymotrypsin to get active, a cut is required which removes one small region from the protein and makes it active. Now this active form of the protein can further degrade other proteins. Now if you're, if you're wondering that you have learned so much about the structures and the functions of the protein, so how do we determine the structure of a protein? There are several techniques such as X-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy and MR spectroscopy that help us determine the shape of a protein. These techniques give 3D atomic coordinates of a protein which are saved in a protein data bank and can be further used to visualize and study them. You will be learning more about these databases and resources in the upcoming lectures. Thank you for listening.